Good afternoon, everyone. We warmly welcome you to the sixth and latest roundtable organized by Bangladesh Institute of Peace and Security Studies and Dhaka Tribune. Today, our topic of discussion would be the emerging world order, how will Bangladesh navigate? And to discuss on that topic, we have, we are very pleased to have two profound speakers among us, and I would very much like to request our president, Major General A.N. Munir Zaman, to moderate the session. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And a very warm welcome to all of you distinguished participants, ambassadors, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon and assalamu alaikum. We are meeting here to discuss a topic which is extremely pertinent today, and that is the emerging world order. In particular, how should Bangladesh navigate this new world order? As you would agree with me that at the end of the Cold War, we perhaps temporarily came to a unipolar moment. And that unipolar moment did not last very long as we saw the forces of multipolarity coming into the play. Very recently, we also saw a strong push from emerging and powerful powers and rising global powers like China. But two events have completely shaken the international system. And that is COVID-19, which has brought the world to a turning point of its existing world order, and very recently, the conflict in Ukraine. So therefore, we see complete international order, which is in a flux. New elements of fluidity has been injected into the system, and we don't know where it is going to shape up. As small powers, as middle powers, it is very pertinent for all of us to constantly study and monitor the international system so that we find our rightful place in our national interest. A definite trend of the new international world order is that the world is perhaps once again going to experience what we should call Cold War 2.0, in which the world perhaps will not be divided on ideological ground. But more pertinent for us to now talk about and see how the conflict in Ukraine is shaking the international system and where it ends. We have two very excellent panelists today, Mr. Toy Dusen, who is our former foreign secretary, and Dr. Ali Ashraf, a professor of international relations from Dhaka University. Before I hand over the floor to them, some points about house rules. We are all speaking here on record, so it is not a chat mouse session. Whatever is spoken here will be recorded, and a complete video will be placed in the YouTube channel within the next two days. And I can also tell you that our Dhaka Tribune previous YouTube channel's presentations of this kind of sessions have had more than 100,000 views, so it is very widely viewed. And we will also be, together with Dhaka Tribune, bringing up a one-page supplement of the whole proceedings of what we discuss here today. So with that very brief introduction, I hand over the floor to our first speaker, Mr. Toy Dusen. Thank you. Thank you, General Moniz Jaman, uh, a friend of at least 22 years. <laughs> we did our NDC together. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, now, the emerging world order, Yanmur uh, uh, Jaman has already spoken what has uh, brought in the emergence of a new order, but um, what are the changes that have brought in a, uh, that has shaken the world order? Of course, the last event he has mentioned, that is very important, but then um, he has also mentioned the rise of China. The rise of China as a dominant and assertive world power. Um, assertive I am saying because I can find from my observations that particularly for the last 10 years about, China is much more assertive that, than it used to be before that for the previous 20 or 30 years. Although it was growing very fast, its influence was also growing, but it did not really assert itself. Um, uh, here th there is an irony of uh, the Henry Kissinger's mismanagements, misjudgments of 1971. Uh, 
the U.S. of 1971, under his guidance and that of his president, had taken the side of a uh, of a rather genocidal regime, rather than going for in favor of the democratically elected uh, elements. Uh, they had taken, um, they opened up to China because they thought it was very important to have China as their ally against the Soviet Union, and thereby they have they paved the way for China to become, in these about 50 years, the real rival of um, the U.S. Uh, it is sure that the rise of China was inevitable. That would have happened in any case. But the support, the active support of the U.S. has much quickened the process. And China is at least 20 years ahead of what it would have been without the U.S. support. Um, the Western design now to contain China in the Pacific strategy, the Quad, the AUKUS. Um, in the Pacific strategy, this has been there uh, for quite some time, uh, you know, the, being spoken about. But then the Quad is a relatively uh, recent phenomenon. And then uh, from September 2021, we have the AUKUS. Uh, 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 suddenly it came up. Uh, and um, on the AUKUS, I would with Mr. Uh, General Murray Jamal's permission, I would just quote him. Uh, he had written a piece in uh, Prathamalo on this. And very rightly, he has said that uh, uh, AUKUS could destabilize the regional and sub-regional uh, st strategic balance that currently prevails in this region. Uh, in fact, this was an event in which, uh, which had very uh, adverse repercussions both in, both in Asia and in Europe. The French were furious because they had already uh, put quite a bit of money uh, in the, in the uh, submarines that they were supposed to provide to Australia, whereas uh, suddenly they found that uh, their, the deal is being cancelled, uh, and Germany came up in support of uh, France. So we can see that uh, as we look at the West, on each and every issue they may not be on the same plane. Uh, very, two very important countries. Uh, Germany and France uh, came out against the AUKUS. The third point is the COVID-19 pandemic, which has already been mentioned. And this definitely is going to change a lot of things. Uh, now, apart from, the, um, apart from the health issues, what the COVID-19 uh, showed, it showed that the over-dependence of the world on China for its consumer goods and intermediate goods can be potentially dangerous. Because uh, when there was problem and then there was this uh, shutting down of the factories in China, uh, the problem of communication, the, uh, you know, this, uh, the ships were not uh, moving with the, with the goods and the, the whole world is, was in a jittery. This should not have happened because the problem had started only in China at that time. And that had shaken the entire world. So there is a lesson to be learned here. Uh, a small point, but I think can have some uh, effects also on the new, new realities, which is the virtual defeat and retreat of the US from Afghanistan. Very quickly, uh, the Taliban occupied what they had lost 20 years back. And um, this could have re uh, ramifications for in the region and beyond, because it is a a completely different type, type of government that we have now in Afghanistan, although not recognized by the world, but then uh, it's a reality. You recognize it or not, it is there. You are not going to be able to remove it. The Americans tried for 20 years and then failed. Um, now comes the question of the last one, the uh, war in Ukraine between Russia and Ukraine. Well, our uh, Russian friends don't want to use the word uh, term war, but then if we look at it by any means, it's a war. Uh, there are quite a few lessons to be learned from this conflict. Nobody ever believed that these two countries will be at war because they have such good friendly relations for such a long time. Similar history and the tussle about uh, whether uh, Nikolai Gogol was a Russian or a, or a Ukrainian, etc., etc. So close culturally, uh, even economically, and otherwise. And then there has been a, a conflagration between the two countries. So 
there is a lesson here for, as you say, the lesser powers, the intermediate powers, that no relation is sacrosanct. No relation is, can guarantee you, no level of friendship can guarantee you that there will never be a conflict between you two. Other lesson that comes in, even a much weaker country, much weaker country like Ukraine, can withstand a much stronger country's conflicts with unity and support from both sides. Um, whether we agree or not, all of us may not agree, but then apparently the Russian plans have not worked. Uh, the, the plan to, be, uh, to uh, overrun the country very quickly have a uh, pro-Russian government there. The Russia never said this, but that is the speculation that's going on. That did not succeed. So, and an important offshoot of this conflict has been Germany. For 75 years, Germany has been pacifist, very peaceful, etc. For the first time, they have uh, they have decided to exceed their defense budget by more than two percent of their GDP. And they have already taken a plan for military modernization, which they had not been doing for the, uh, after their defeat in the World War II. So these are the things that are happening in the world. Well, how will Bangladesh navigate? We come to that point, OK? Now we have to look at the Bangladesh realities. It's completely different from what it was in the 70s and 80s. Absolutely a dependent country. More than 7% of GDP came from aid. In fact, there was a time when our uh, the uh, uh, the aid, uh, volume of aid was more than the development uh, budget, which means that the aid even went into the, uh, you know, the normal budget of paying salaries and things like that. We have uh, really come a long way from that. It's less than 1% now, the uh, aid. And the, now the business uh, investment uh, exports, these are much more important now. Uh, exports reached a billion only in 86, 87. And now it is more than $40 billion. Tremendous improvements Bangladesh has made in all these respects. In social sector also, you know that uh, it's the only Muslim country apart from Turkey where you have gender parity in primary, role, uh, primary education uh, enrollment. And uh, we are about to achieve this in the secondary stage also. So things have improved a lot. Um, but that doesn't mean that everything is very, uh, very smooth. We have... Uh, uh, the institutions in our country are undergoing a very bad phase. In, in most of the areas, uh, we are, uh, you know, in many cases, we are going back. Uh, we have uh, in democracy, in human rights, and in the indicators that are there all over the world uh, by reliable, quote unquote, institutions that they make it, we have done badly. Then what are our relations with the uh, neighborhood? Most important relations, of course, is with India and next with China. And with these countries, we have, uh, we have been able to maintain a balance. I would say that very well balanced because both these countries are close friends of us, uh, although they have an adversarial relation with each other. So we must say that we have done this uh, uh, quite well. Uh, for India, we have an excellent relation for quite some time, but uh, they're, uh, say they're, they have a huge trade uh, balance with us. Uh, uh, we have helped them uh, to take care of their insurgent groups in the um, northeastern states. Uh, we have given them uh, uh, the access uh, to the northeastern states over our territory. Um, uh, these are fine, but then there are some uh, unhappiness among the population in Bangladesh because uh, our uh, steps that we took, it is believed that it has not, those have not been reciprocated by the Indians. And, uh, you know, that, uh, the trust that uh, is the basis of relationship between, the, between any two countries, uh, that has uh, actually affected the trust of the Bangladeshi people in India. Um, there are also some minor irritants uh, like the Citizenship Amendment Act, which equates Bangladesh with Pakistan and Afghanistan. Uh, then there is this um, citizenship register of Assam, which uh, 
you know, excludes many of the uh, Bengali speakers in that state. So these are irritants, but of, co of course, uh, I think the uh, one that affects uh, the uh, popular psyche most is the killing of uh, civilians in the border by the uh, border security force of India. This is not, this does not happen anywhere in the world in peaceful borders, except peaceful and friendly countries' borders, except Bangladesh and India. Well, people say that uh, the relations have uh, passed the test of time, but the test of time is a continuous process. Uh, time doesn't stay static. Um, China, we have uh, economic relations, very important economic relations. China understands uh, that uh, and aware of our, uh, you know, relations with India because China is pragmatist. They are very practical. They know that uh, relation with uh, between Bangladesh and India has to be closed because of geographical, historical, and other reasons. So uh, uh, this is the overall environment that Bangladesh, uh, Bangladesh acts. Bangladesh uh, follows its uh, foreign policies, its defense policies, and uh, everything. So now uh, there are a number of challenges uh, that Bangladesh faces, not only vis-a-vis -vis the uh, security situation, but also otherwise. For example, uh, we have a large population, and we have uh, we are in a period of uh, demographic, demographic dividend because we have a uh, very large proportion of the young people. But unfortunately, the uh, quality of human resource is very poor. For which some of our workers, we have a close to between eight and ten million people working abroad, but they are some of the lowest paid in the world because of the. Uh, skill shortages. So this is one uh, challenge that we need to uh, face because the uh, if you have to be an important player, if you have to be uh, a mid mid level power or uh, in the high table, we have to be uh, we have to be powerful. And being powerful doesn't mean only the military. You need to have the economic power. You need to have the knowledge power, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And there we are somewhat lacking. The inter internet speed in our country is. Uh, this Mali law, which is also not, uh, doesn't uh, go very well for us. Um, the basis of our economic prosperity, we have seen 25 years of very good growth, but the basis has some weaknesses. One is that um, the job of the uh, huge army of garments workers, much of it is going to be taken over by artificial intelligence and robotics, uh, robotics in the next 10 to 15 years. Uh, we are really not prepared to upgrade ourselves so that this loss can be covered up very easily. So this is one point. Uh, economically, it's a challenge for us. Remittance uh, is good, but then, um, as I said, that there is limit to the uh, work and remittance of the unskilled workers that we are sending, unless we improve our uh, human, res human resource quality. Uh, this might become a challenge. Agriculture is doing very well. Uh, but also we have the problem of overcropping and uh, nutrition depletion, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, we are good on um, balance of payment so far, but uh, our good friend uh, Professor Mustafi is of CPD. He has given us a nine points. Uh, I will not spell out those, uh, which may put us in a debt trap in in the in the in the long run. Um, and once you are stuck in the uh, mid-income middle income, uh, trap, it's very difficult to get out of it. Uh, there is no record of any country which has fallen into that trap and, and then gone out of it. And we have a, a genuine risk of getting, getting into that. In fact, India is in this, uh, uh, in this trap. Vietnam is in this trap. Uh, even uh, Malaysia, Brazil, Argentina in the upper middle income trap, they have not been able to uh, move out of that in many years, 33 years. Uh, now coming to the uh, real conflicting things, that the conflicting relationship that has developed between the, in the region between the U.S., China, and India, you know, this, this conflicting situation, that puts us in a bad situation because uh, Bangladesh uh, enjoys uh, excellent relations with all these three countries, all these three powers, but they have their own problems, and there is a, uh, there, although the government would not agree, but then we know that there has been pressure to, for us to join one of the sides, and uh, we cannot afford to do that plain and simple at this moment. We don't know what will happen after 20 years, but then 
right at this moment, we are not in a position to uh, take one side and make others our enemies. So um, I think, uh, last of all, we have the uh, Rohingya issue. Um, for us, it's a huge challenge. And then um, our planning security, economy, society for the next 10, 15, 20 years, we have to factor in the uh, Rohingya issue because that is going to affect us adversely and uh, very strongly. Uh, we all know the history, so we, I'm not going into that, but then uh, the uh, solution to this problem can only come from uh, what the Prime Minister said in the uh, UN General Assembly and what Kofi Annan Commission had said. They have 88 recommendations. Uh, but there is no progress whatsoever in the last four years in that direction, and that is a serious security uh, problem for us. And it is, by the day, it is becoming more security problem because even internal security within the camps uh, has become a, an issue these days. Now, um, we expected China to help us in this respect. China has excellent relations with both the countries, with both Myanmar and Bangladesh. But uh, uh, unfortunately, we have, that has not been forthcoming. There has been an initiative for uh, tripartite dialogue under the, you know, some sort of uh, a little bit under the auspices of the Chinese, but that has also not really worked out very well. Um, but uh, let me, let me uh, mention this, that um, China has its own interests uh, to pursue. Uh, China. Okay, I can do that. Um, okay. Uh, some important developments have taken place in this area, which is the National Unity Government, and uh, they have, for the first time, mentioned the uh, Rohingyas as Rohingyas. So I think that is one important development that has taken place, although uh, the uh, National Unity Government is not going to defeat the Tatmado and uh, come to power. So what are our, are our options then? Uh, I think the uh, important thing for us is to look for new friends. I just put it bluntly like that. Well, it doesn't mean that we make enemy of our friends. No, they remain our friends. But we need other friends who would help us overcome this problem uh, and uh, take care of our, uh, our uh, position. Uh, we need to, of course, uh, invest in human resource. We have, to, uh, we have to try to become an alternate source of, I think, with uh, the industrial development of the last 30 years, has taken us to a position where we can partially substitute China as provider of uh, consumer goods to the world. And this is one area in which we should seek cooperation from others. But uh, I just would make one small point and stop, which is that um, militarily, we need to develop a minimum deterrence capability, which in my opinion, we do not have now. Uh, although most people do not think that uh, that is very important, but I believe this is important. And in this respect, I think one area where we can explore is Europe. I am um, not speaking about the U.S. Who are, uh, and China and India who are directly involved in mutual conflicts, but Europe is somewhat different from the uh, uh, you know, Western uh, center of power, which is the U.S. And so I think that in our quest for um, strategic uh, thinking, in our strategic uh, improvement of our situation, we can perhaps uh, look at Europe. And uh, maybe we can go into bigger details in question and answer session. Thank you so much. I have not taken too much time at all. Okay. So thank you very much for your very excellent analysis of the system. And we do note that you have mentioned that our aid dependence on foreign aid has drastically gone down over the last years and decades. But what has gone up is our market <coughs> dependence. So we cannot be devolved from the international system. Our market dependence of our ready-made garments and other export items indicates that we have to be very careful in articulating our international relationships and remain within the system. COVID-19 must be factored in as we see our relationship evolving with many countries and regions. 
We also see a potential threat to multilateralism, and that is something we have to take note of. There are elements of geopolitics which is coming back to the fore again, and the Westphalian state system that has endured for many years is once again under threat. So there are new elements of uncertainty that are completely unknown to the international system and for which countries like Bangladesh must take note of. We must also be aware of the forces of geotechnology that has certainly a big role to play in forging international relationships, bilateral relationships, and how the international system functions. So these are some of the elements that we have to take note of. But to talk about these and much more, I invite the next speaker, Dr. Ali Ashraf, Professor of International Relations in Dhaka University. Sir, you have the floor. Thank you, sir. Um, I think it's an absolute pleasure to be here and um, to be able to speak to such an informed audience and uh, on such an interesting topic that concerns the emerging new world order. And, and, and the key question is, how is Bangladesh likely to navigate um, through these um, changes and transformations in the, in, in the world order. Being an academic, uh, we always try to be the you know, theoretical and uh, more you know, abstract theor theorization of uh, empirical events are our expertise, and, uh, but the topic requires much more substantive discussions on policy areas. So I will try to come out of my comfort zone of being an academic and, uh, and uh, be more pragmatic in terms of engaging uh, the audience with some of the practical issues. My previous uh, speaker got 20 minutes, and I think with the, with the equity principle, I'll be getting approximately, maybe I'll try to finish much earlier, although 10 minutes is the, is the, is the time limit. Let me divide um, uh, my, my um, I would say statement or my remarks into five broad thematic areas. First, I'll try to talk about what or world order is all about, and then talk about uh, historical transformations in the world order, then come to the point like what emerging world order really means, they, because the floor might have different definitions, uh, and then talk about the national aspirations and interest of Bangladesh, which is the end goal, and then the f ultimate question would be how we, we are going to navigate to reach the destination and the end goals. So to begin with the world order, and uh, IR theorists are, are notoriously divided on the, on the definition of world order, because uh, we don't agree on what the world order actually is all about. Um, there are three broad schools of thought, the, the realists, the liberals and the Marxist. And the realists define world order in terms of power politics. And the, the, the central argument is that we need to look at the international system and how military power is divided, I mean the distribution of power, and then if, if, if power is distributed between two major actors, we call it a bipolar system. If power is concentrated in the hands of a single superpower, we call it a unipolar system. If it is divided and distributed among more than two countries and two power blocks, we call it a multipolar system. Uh, and that is a very dominant uh, framing of, of the concept of world order. And secondly, the liberals see things a little more differently. And the argument is that it is not only power politics that leads countries to conflicting situations, rather it is global governance systems, uh, multi multilateral interdependence. So the while the realist scholars look at major actors and their military capabilities and their conflict producing behaviors, liberals look more at international institutions and the way they provide platforms for negotiations, diplomacy, and, and more and more international cooperation. So the, the liberals focus on the, the international institutions like World Bank, IMF, WTO, which regulate global economic governance, and the UN, which which was established for, for, for promoting international peace, security, and stability. So the realists are pessimists and the liberals are optimists. The third school of thought that comes from the Marxist theory uh, defines world order in terms of economic inequalities between the rich and the poor nations. And the, the dominant argument is that the world order is precisely an economic world order, and here we see more and more exploitation of the proletariat by the rich 
And it is the multinational corporations that are the main actors of these exploitations, and their headquarters are mostly in the global north. So these three theoretical frameworks provide uh, three, three very competing visions of the definition of world order. So that's the, the, the theoretical part. Secondly, the question is, uh, has the world order remained constant or it has transformed over the years? And here we see that um, um, we, we more or less agree that uh, during the Cold War period, the world was bipolar. The world order or the international system was bipolar. Uh, the Soviet and the American blocs dominated the East-West confrontation. The Western bloc was led by the United States. The Eastern bloc led by the Soviet Union and East Central and East European countries. So a new world order began in the 1990s after the collapse of the Soviet Union and the demise of the Warsaw Pact. And uh, for, so far, since the 1990s, we we almost thought that uh, you know that we are going to live in an uh, unlimited era of liberty, democracy, good governance, prosperity, and civilizational uh, wisdom. Um, and 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 it was really a time like uh, the third wave of democratization swept over Europe. Many of the former Central and East European autocracies, you know, transformed. And, and partly they transformed not only because of their domestic imperatives, but also they wanted to be part of the West. And the search for being part of the West led to the expansion of NATO and the EU. Um, so the new world order, I mean, we saw that uh, in the post-Cold War era, uh, you know, it, it saw the emergence of the United States to be the lone superpower and Russia losing the superpower status, becoming a great, remaining the great power. Then 9-11 happened. And uh, the a kind of global systemic transformation we almost were witnessing, and the global war on terrorism becoming another another buzzword in defining the world order. And in the in the global war on terrorism, we saw that the 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 threat was not a nation state, rather a transnational terrorist phenomenon. Al Qaeda becoming the major threat, and then ISIS becoming another threat, both transnational but having lots of sig I mean significant influence at the domestic level on the homegrown extremist networks and also their regional allies. So what happened in the, since the, in the, in the post 9-11 era is that uh, there were new references to new medievalism as if the world order has become, uh, a, a, you know, similar to what happened in the Middle Ages like uh, violent extremism, transnational organized crime, human trafficking, state fragility, all of these things were creating lots of tensions in the world, I mean, and also uh, also the basic perimeter of the world order has always been the Westphalian order, as General Morin has said, that, that we live in a system of uh, sovereign nation states that was originated in 1648 with the Treaty of Westphalia. Despite all these systemic transformations from Cold War to post-Cold War, from pre-9-11 to post-9-11, the basic order and its ordering principles and features remain the same. We respect modern nation state, whether we, we, we condone, condemn the aggressors or, or not condemn, we, we believe in this organizing principle. So what happened in the post 9-11 era is uh, the Westphalian state came under attack from multinational, multiple sources of threats. It is not only the nation state, but also the non-state actors becoming a source of the threat. Um, so I defined uh, the world order, the historical transformations, and then the next question is uh, what, what, what is it, the, the new and the emerging world order? That, that is the, the topic for today. And my argument is that uh, there is no time limit in this definition of emerging. If we s start from the 1990s, then we, the big question would be whether we are still living in a uh, unipolar world or a bipolar world or a multipolar world. But I think uh, this Ukraine crisis has uh, given a new meaning to this term, emerging world order, and uh, and living in this context. I mean, since 2000, to, since the 24th of um, February 2022, with the Russia, and we can call invasion of Ukraine, special operations in Ukraine, doesn't matter. The question is, uh, is the world order, are we witnessing a transformation in the world order? And if yes, the question is, how is Bangladesh going to navigate? So let us, let us uh, try to see what is happening since uh, the February Ukraine crisis. Um, well, uh, initially, uh, you know, bef long before the, uh, the Russian war against Ukraine or the special ops against Ukraine, we have seen the, uh, the, the, the deployment of a large scale, nearly 200,000 Russian troops in the, in the Ukrainian eastern border. 
And then um, all on a sudden, in a few weeks, we have seen that um, the Donbas region, comprising Donetsk and Luhansk in eastern Ukraine, predominantly populated by the Russian-speaking people, uh, who had been having uh, insurgent movements since 2014, right after Crimea was annexed by Russia, right? Those two predominantly pro-Russia-speaking people populated the region and uh, declared kind of autonomy or slash independence, and the Russia recognized it, and followed by uh, special military attacks and, and war. And then we see a new kind of polarization in the world system. Right, and, and in this new polarization, we have seen that uh, the United States got uh, its uh, predominant in NATO allies, uh, France, Germany, mostly, and also Ukraine's neighbors like Poland to be on the side, uh, while Russia has managed to court the friendship of China and India. And uh, so there are newer talks about whether we are witnessing a third world war or where, whether we are witnessing a new world uh, order. Uh, and and uh, you know, General Munir has referred to it as a Cold War 2.0, as if that we are witnessing a new Cold War between the uh, American bloc of democracies versus the pro-Russia camp, uh, which includes China dominantly and also India. Um, so the question is, um, you know. Um, what what are the what are the implications of this new new dynamics on, on a country like Bangladesh. That is the substantive part of the discussions. So let us try to understand the uh, foreign policy aspirations of Bangladesh, and then what are the national interests, and what are the expectations, and then, then we can see the, how these external events are going to constrain our choices and interests. Um, and also, one, one should recognize that uh, foreign policy aspirations do not remain constant. Uh, rather, they change over time. As uh, Ambassador Tohid has rightly pointed that, uh, you know, we have made a lot of progresses. And, well, if we begin with 1971, immediately after the independence of the country, our primary aspirations were getting as much recognition as we can get. And then secondly, reconstruction. Post-war country needed reconstruction. So here we see that, uh, you know, our, our concentration was more about investing our diplomatic energy in getting recognition and economic reconstruction. So foreign aid was a priority, uh, getting the support of as many countries as you can. Today, if we fast forward 50 years later, our priority is our, you know, our aspiration is to become a developing country. Uh, so let us have a quick look at the checklist of what we prioritize. Um, RMG, ready-made government exports is one of our, I mean, it is the leading source of our uh, foreign exchange earnings. And also uh, remittances from the migrant workers. Um, so the biggest challenge for Bangladesh is to diversify the export basket. And uh, as, uh, as Ambassador Tohid has rightly said, that um, we also have to anticipate the way these artificial intelligence, robotic machines can displace the human labor. Although I have spoken to um, more than a dozen RMG producers, and I understand that uh, these AI, the artificial intelligence, or, or automated machines are coming very slow. I, the oven sector has become fully automated, partly, but the niche sector, the substantial part of the RMG sector is yet to be fully automated, partly because it is investment. It requires heavy investment, and we don't see that much investment coming at the moment. So maybe that is a near-term um, concern, not the, not the immediate concern today. but. What is a matter of concern is we need to diversify our, our, our export earnings. And, uh, and also moving from uh, this low cost uh, RMG tailoring to high cost, high end products manufacturing. On top of that, we need more skilled uh, training and also a rights friendly RMG governance system. Secondly, on ter in, in terms of the, the, R the, the remittance earning, uh, so the, the labor migration. The Saudi Arabia and the UAE are the top sources of our uh, top destinations for the Bangladeshi migrant workers. Uh, we, have, we do have Singapore, Malaysia, and some East Asian countries to be our newer destinations, but bigger challenge is to diversify the, the market for the labor migrants. And, and, uh, and, and another challenge is to, um, so we need to sustain the existing market and then explore the newer markets. And there have, has been some very minor progresses. There's also a need for investing in human skills development, the soft skills, um, because most of the remittance earners in, in Bangladesh are actually low-skilled cleaners, construction workers, and, 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 and there is 10 to 12 percent uh, female migrant workers, most of which are actually in the domestic servitude, I mean domestic houseworks, and uh, most of them are 
um, you know, the victims of huge human rights abuses. So our challenge is also to to promote, uh, to regulate and improve the good governance in the in the labor migration sector. The third foreign policy priority, I would say, and I completely agree with him that uh, the Rohingya refugee issue and. Uh, and we have seen a polarization of our neighbors, China and India, taking Myanmar's side and the West, uh, including Australia, United States, Canada, and the Netherlands supporting us in terms of holding Myanmar accountable in the International Court of Justice. So what we can possibly expect is that, um, you know, investing our diplomatic energy to get these uh, Asian giant neighbors on our side and also because we, what we, what we expect is that uh, repatriation of 1.1 million Rohingyas is our one of the topmost priorities. And uh, bilateral diplomacy has failed. We did, we, we did internationalize it by going to the UN. The Prime Minister's speeches appealed. The the UNHCR has made global appeals, but this Ukrainian refugee crisis is going to displace the Rohingya refugee crisis at the top agenda in the global refugee you know debates. So there is a need for constant uh, sensitizing the international community on this thing. Defense modernization definitely is one of our top priorities, and 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 there is no doubt. And on this question, I think there has been repeated discussions of diversifying our sources of the weapons and equipments, and there are valid reasons for that because um, because. There's a need for um, uh, equipping us with the, with the, with the, with the superior technologies, and, and and definitely the cost is a factor as well because it is not that uh, we can go to the market and buy new weapons. There is a need for also funding, the you know, looking for alternative sources of money. Bangladesh is a leading provider of the UN peacekeeping forces, and I think it is also in our top national interest to maintain this uh, this uh, leading position in the in the in the global security provider scenario. And here, what we witness is there are multiple challenges in terms of uh, you know peacekeeping missions are becoming increasingly riskier. Mali being the worst example. So here, what is the the tension is that we believe in traditional peacekeeping where we are reluctant to use force, but the newer missions are becoming riskier, demanding use of force. So what what we witness is that not only Bangladesh, it's South Asian neighbors, Indian and Pakistani peacekeepers also see that the Nordic countries, smaller troop contributing nations are increasingly adopting what is called a robust peacekeeping model, where they, they don't hesitate to use force, but uh, the, the challenge is that uh, you can always, um, um, you know, you can always antagonize, you know, the, the, the local forces, rebel forces, and which is going to have produce more casualties. But the fact that the Bangladeshi contingents, part of the UN contingents, often are co-located with the French and the European contingents, and then that they are doing robust peacekeeping, we are doing traditional peacekeeping. So they, if they antagonize the rebels, we take the hit as well. So these things are perennial issues, this migration, RMG, Rohingya issues, uh, peacekeeping, plus We've got a new priority, which is counterterrorism. We want to be in the good books of the international society, and, and violent extremism has been uh, has been a challenge in Bangladesh since the late 90s, and we have seen that more than 100 attacks, and four major groups, and then some of them were either inspired by external groups or either motivated. Uh, we, we deny the linkage, fine, but inspirational linkage is also very vital. So our our priorities have so far been modernizing the the capabilities of the law enforcement and the intelligence agencies and also uh, thinking of how military forces could be the last resort, the holy artisan being the last example. We had to deploy the para, you know, para commando battalions there. Um, so given all this scenario, let us talk about like, uh, you know, what is our priority and how, how we navigate. It is a, there's a naval connotation here. Let me get much like how I'm, I'm, I'm going to cross this path and go there where, where my uh, target and desired goals are there. Well. Um, this is interesting because when it came to, let's say, the, the two votes in the UN General Assembly, right, uh, on um, early February, early, early March and late March, yeah. let's call it simple, we we abstained, and then we voted. Um, but look at look at the text of the UN um, General Assembly resolutions. Let me let me. The first resolution, there were some strong wordings uh, calling Russia to immediate, for immediate, complete, unconditional withdrawal. Now this is, you know, being a student of IR, I, I go back to the theories and I see that this is a very liberal expectation. 
that, and it, it sounds good because sovereignty is a cardinal principle in the international order. And we want countries to respect sovereignty. So what Russia has done is precisely a violation of the sovereignty of Ukraine. My Russian friends, you don't like me, fine. But this is fact because this is going to create a dangerous precedent in the world order. I mean, a small country and your foreign policy don't like it, it, it wants to join NATO, fine. But diplomacy could be the last resort. Well, well, fine, then the war began. And maybe as a student of IR, I thought that, well, taking Donbass region, Russia would be happy. But the way it was, it is moving to multiple directions and, and demanding Zelensky to, to collapse and, and, and reinstating Viktor Yanukovych as a puppet regime. These are definitely uh, precedences and many countries, even China and India will not like it. Trust me, because they also have their ethnic insurgencies. So the facade that we are witnessing, the, the way China and India are calculating their economic gains by getting closer to Russia has multiple, uh, multiple meanings for us. We do understand that th these were strong wordings, and, and Bangladesh remain abstain from the voting. And the prime minister today gave a, gave a strong rationale, which, which, which I think she was very frank by saying that, um, also referring to Russian uh, tremendous contribution during the 1971 liberation war. So this historical reference to Russia, and the fact that Russia has been one of the uh, best energy uh, partners for Bangladesh, the Rupur, uh, nuclear power plant is being constructed, and 90% of, of, of the funding coming from Russia with state credits, right? And let, let's be frank and candid. Once these reactors are installed and the electricity is connected to the power grid, Bangladesh is going to be dependent on Russia for the next 50 years because an average life longevity for a nuclear power plant is, let's say, 40 to 50 years. It's a VV year, Generation 3 plus technology, which is a superior technology, meaning perhaps one reason for Bangladesh to remain abstained in the UN voting is that we did not antagonize the relations to a point where we, this uh, power plant is going to be affected, partly because energy security is also in our top priority. But then look at the next uh, resolution's wording. It refers more to humanitarian protection, creating a safe zone for humanitarian civilians, Ukrainian civilians, plus uh, humanitarian protection providers, and, as well as journalists, doctors, and others. And I think there is valid reason to be siding with, uh, with humanitarianism, but, but these two voting behavior of Bangladesh indicates, and also it reminds us of the IR theories, that humanitarianism and national interest would be the two de defining principles for our voting behavior in the international political system when it comes to dealing with Russia. Let, us, let me conclude. Um, so we have, or what I'm trying to argue is that uh, despite all these uh, high politics debates, like whether we are going to be in the Chinese axis or the Russian axis or the American, I think we got multiple competing uh, demands from our engagement with international partners. Remember I said that uh, RMG is our top uh, source of earnings, roughly $40 billion. And uh, 15, uh, you know, uh, most of it goes to the United States and in fact a bigger chunk of our RMG products go to the European Union markets, where Germany, France, and the neighbors are the, and UK as well, are, are our biggest destinations. So do you want to antagonize that RMG market as well? The answer is no, meaning that we have to make a, we have to strike a balance between managing our trading relations with the West, at the same time uh, maintaining our good relations with these uh, Russian energy supplies, and, 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 and keeping in mind that China is one of our strongest defense partners and with India, we have got uh, borders in three sides. So these geopolitical realities, these geoeconomic compulsions, and our calculations of the global systemic transformations, all of these will require us to navigate in a way that uh, requires more pragmatism and a balance between national interest and humanitarianism. And often these two don't, don't com complement, rather contradict, because the pursuit of national interest is often require you to vote uh, for, against or remain silent on the question of humanity and sovereignty principles. So I think that here comes the, the question of PR campaign, public relations. I mean, the diplomacy has to be, has to be good enough to communicate uh, credibly that, look, we are taking principal position, but not at the cost of the national interest. So I think that for a country uh, like Bangladesh, there's a need for uh, more pragmatism, more proactive articulation of the national interest, and I think that, uh, that uh, and also, also there, there are lots of challenges of good governance and democracy, definitely, definitely we need to also 
uh, be in the good books of the international community by improving our records in human rights, good governance, and democracy. I think I, I'll be stopping here, and then we'll be uh, going to have more discussion in the Q&A. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Ashraf. As you very rightly said, that it is a tough navigation. Not many sailors can navigate a sea as complex as the international system is today. Particularly, Bangladesh will have to find its way out as to how to balance between BRI, of which we are a signatory, and our aspirations to be in, in the Pacific strategy. These are becoming competing, competing strategies of two very different camps, and it is not easy for a nation to be in both. So therefore, these are some of the compulsions that Bangladesh will have to face, and a pragmatic approach to adopting a national policy, keeping in our national interest in view, is perhaps the best way to go. But I don't know how far our very foundations of our foreign policy goals or dictums, friendship to all, malice to none, how far and how long it can survive, the test is a question. I open the floor now for your questions and comments, observations. Please feel free to say anything, and we'll be happy to pass them back to our panelists for them to give their comments and answers. Please raise your hand, and I will come to you as I see the hands. Let me have a look around the room first. I will first go to you, sir, a Vice Marshal. You have the floor. Thank you very much. I would like to thank both the speakers for their wonderful presentation. Uh, in fact, uh, the professor has ta talked about three types of order. First one is your realist order from theoretical point of view. Uh, when it comes to realist order, then I would say that for Bangladesh to navigate is to have a very strong military deterrence. It was a lack of deterrence that probably had uh, encouraged Myanmar to push in the Rohingya refugees to Bangladesh. If you look up the north, then we see that there is a place called Chumbi Valley up north in Indian Territory. And if there is kind of minor or major conflict between China and India, then that neutrality would be breached and Bangladesh will lose some of its territory because of suffering from the uh, Belgian syndrome that happened in 1914. Uh, when Belgium was uh, violated by the German troops uh, 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 by the Schlieffen plan. The second one is the liberal order, which relates to the economic development. For that, if we look at the region, we have talked about the global order, but we, don't, I mean, we must also talk about the South Asian order. And if we want a liberal order in South Asia, then Bangladesh has to come very closer to India and the other uh, states of South Asia in terms of intra-regional trade. And finally, when it comes to a Marxian order, and the most important thing is to build institutions. Uh, institutions in which the distribution is of justice at least is guaranteed to the common people. I was the High Commissioner of uh, Bangladesh in Brunei Darussalam, and there I have seen how the expatriate workers are exploited. That means we do not have a proper institution for managing their treatment abroad. Uh, we always say that we get a lot of money in terms of remittance from, uh, from these kind of uh, uh, illegal, I mean legal expatriate workers. But the point is that uh, their political cost or social cost is very high. We never, in fact, take into account the political cost of human existence involved in earning remittances. So these are the three important things we must have a a strong military deterrence posture. Second one is that we have to come closer to India and the other states of South Asia in terms of interregional trade. And third, we have to build institutions. There are no alternate to institutions. If I don't feel confident enough that I have a right to give my vote independently, then probably the very existence of individual, uh, so far the ontological uh, context of order is concerned is jeopardized. Thank you very much. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, my name is Ruhul Amin. I have been a student of the Department of International Relations, University of Dhaka. Uh, I'm very sorry for late and for not being able to listen to your presentations, Avanbhai, 
and Ashraf's uh, wonderful presentation on the emerging world order and how Bangladesh should navigate. And so far, I understand Ashraf has raised the issues that are very prominent from a historical point of view. So the topic, the emerging world order, how Bangladesh should navigate, is an issue of international relations today. And how we do analyze and understand international relations, there are two ways, you know. One is historical, another is ontological. Historically, how the global society is running, the way nation state we see today was not the nation state or global society before. We are in a global society where nation states are interacting or non-nation states are interacting is a result of the Westphalian system. Like Westphalian system collapsed after the League of Nations, and like United Nations, I don't know, seems to be collapsing possibly after the failure of League of Nations. So international relations need to be understood more from historical than from ontological point of view. Problem for Bangladesh's diplomacy and our foreign policy is that we don't know to what directions our diplomacy or foreign policy need to be geared up. Ontologically, there is lack of scarcity of resources, understanding, projects, formulation policies, and also diplomatic practices. So that's my observation. So if I look at this situation, I want to understand it from ontological point of view. Ashraf has raised an uh, issue of uh, the war on terror. I guess after Russian attack on Ukraine, the concept of war on terror seems to be taking a new turn in the understanding of international relations, both from ontological point of view and from historical point of view. I don't personally believe that the war on terror is an academic topic. However, it's a political topic. And it has imposed concept by the West on the non-West. I would say the American, Euro-American Western scholars has created, manufactured this concept called war on terror, targeting their enemies. Like uh, uh, my Russian friends, if they are here, when Russia was under communism, following the Bolshevik revolutions, Russia, USSR, Australia USSR, was considered as the loathsome creature by United States of America. You know, Marshall Plan, Truman Doctrine, even creation NATO was targeted to prevent United States, uh, sorry, USSR's communism. And after collapse of USSR, demise of USSR, and the defunct of communism as a political ideology, Western world needed a new threat. And they manufactured non-Western immersing ideologies. And so ontologically speaking, they manufactured the type of war on terror. For example, Afghanistan issue. The Afghan freedom fighters, we, I'm a citizen of Bangladesh. You know all of history of Bangladesh. In 1971, our liberation war was considered as a secessionist war. And America supported, American foreign policy, American government supported that. And we are considered as the terrorists. Our freedom fighters were considered as the terrorists. And the creation of, even the architect of our independence, Bangamundi Sheikh Mujib Rahman, was arrested. And there was a case like Agurthala conspiracy case against Bangabandhu and his close associates. They were in jail. And there was uh, 25 searchlight crisis. Of Bangladesh was created through a struggle. If you such, please, uh, keep it short. Yeah, so we I, can I'm go. making short. So such case happened in the case of Afghanistan. So Afghan freedom fighters were also considered as the terrorist. As an academic uh, student of IR, I believe that the war on terror seems to be defined in a new way. Now, whether the Russians will be considered as the terror, or who will be considered as the war on terror? You have said that Russian attack. Russia needs to be concerned about Russian security also. Russia thinks that through UK, NATO can get into uh, in a position that will create a threat to Russia. So I'm not supporting Russian attack on uh, Ukraine, but I'm supporting that Russian security concerns. Second, what would be Bangladesh? So ontology, as I said, there is no resource. Ontologically, Bangladesh needs to proceed with this um, uh, ontological point of view. And uh, if you see from foreign policy perspective, if you want, Bangladesh must look at uh, pragmatic, what Bangabandhu said, friendship to all, malice to none. Our prime concern of foreign policy is economic diplomacy. So what would be our economic diplomacy need to be fine-tuned in the 
in the in the in the changing in realities of emerging international order. So what Bangladesh diplomats or our foreign policy will proceed needs to be practiced, understood, researched, theorized, and analyzed based on the ontological insights of understanding the emerging issue. Without doing that, if we proceed, that will be a great error for Bangladesh foreign policy. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your very elaborate question and your comments. Uh, that was the chairman of Department of International Relations, University of Dhaka. So it is a scholarly comment. <laughs> All big scholars are modest. <laughs> so the next question, please. Zaid, please. Just to, but let me just comment on two points. First, I congratulate uh, Professor uh, from Dhaka University for making one very important point about how Bangladesh peacekeeping missions face a sort of a dual challenge. I was in Mali until last year uh, operating from Kidal, uh, commanding a contingent. And uh, we had uh, the Barkhan forces and the French forces, the European forces, part of it. Aviation University. And um, of course our contingents, Bangladesh uh, peacekeepers. But I would rather sort of um, correct in one area. It's not actually much of a problem of robustness. Bangladesh do conduct robust peacekeeping uh, because it's a chapter seven peacekeeping missions. It's much to do with the mandate that certain elements, for example, the Barkhan forces has, the EUTM has. So a much more detailed uh, insight is required to make sort of these uh, assertions. The Barkhan operates to a different UN Security Council mandate. MINUSMA operates to a different Security Council mandate. The Barkhan has a particular task of counterterrorism role, which is specific in their mandate. And the MINUSMA, which the peacekeepers, was, which, with, in which there is Bangladesh, there is also French, there is also Swedish, they operate, do not have a counterterrorism mandate, but a robust peacekeeping role. So when we use this, uh, this particular uh, jargons, uh, th that's what I wanted to. And this is where I actually uh, came into contact with one of our wonderful diplomat, Rababa Fatima, who is our permanent repre representative. We, I had the distinct honor of working uh, uh, in some issues with her. And that is why I will come to the second point of the UN voting, uh, which uh, uh, Tohid has, uh, sir has rightly said. Actually, we should not uh, diplomacy and foreign policy is not emotion-based, it's objective, interest-based. Uh, and there is a study actually done, pers uh, one by me, which, which takes into consideration of Bangladesh's voting records from 1990 to 2019. It's, it was published in the International Journal, that's where probably most uh, uh, Bangladeshi scholars do not know. Uh, with, with specific findings was Bangladesh's vote at the UN General Assembly, in which currently Rabawa Fatima is our permanent uh, representative Shush, and a very prudent, excellent uh, ambassador. It has always been on the text, on the merit of the text. Let me give you one concrete evidence. You'd imagine all the human rights resolutions on Myanmar, the Bangladesh voting position was supposed to be with the majority. It was not. It was not. Bangladesh voted yes on the Myanmar resolution at the UNGA only when the resolution wording explicitly mentioned Bangladesh as an affected country. So when we question about our diplomats' prudence, we must also go into that deep, into the facts of the matter. Why didn't they vote yes and go with the majority, which was supposed to be our conventional wisdom that we should condemn what is going on in Myanmar. So that is also needs to be absorbed up to that details before we sort of take into make a sort of an assertion that okay, this is what we should be doing. So uh, that was my comment. The particular question uh, to the professor is, he touched on the global governance uh, tools and, and this probably, oh, sorry, it will be, uh, be worth pointing that global governance tools originates from two different platforms. One is multilateral platform, which we have seen from the UNSC, sanction lists, economic LDC, uh, cooperation uh, uh, stimulus package and all these. It has been historically so for Namibia, from South Africa. 
And now we have seen a proliferation of this sort of state-centric sanction list appear, appearing to be globalized, to, be, to make it as a global governance tool. So do you, and I'm not questioning the legitimacy. Each state has the legitimate right to make his or her rule to be global. But the fundamental question is whether such proliferation of state-centric tools to make it a global governance tool is going to fuel more multipolarization. And if so, what does the small state like us do to battle us and to isolate us or insulate us from such uh, sort of uh, regimes, which are not uh, sort of uh, highly legitimate, for example? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our next question is going to be from our young participant, and is Sean. Uh, just to introduce him, Sean is an Erasmus scholar from University of Glasgow who has just joined BIPS two days back as an international intern. Sean, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Oh, that's loud. Um, I just have a sort of short question, just something for us all to reflect on, and I'd appreciate any comments from anyone. In this potentially more multipolar world that we might see in the decades coming forwards, what opportunities do you think that smaller nations and middle powers in the global south will have to challenge this neo-colonial relationships we've seen over the last few years? Particularly, I'm thinking of vaccine inequality between the global north and the global south, climate change and the extraction, continued extraction of resources. So I'm wondering if in this multipolar reality we might see there may be more opportunities for these smaller powers to, to challenge that reality. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, I just uh, would like to ask Tohid a question, uh, if I may. Uh, uh, from our childhood, we have learned about morality, about what is good, what is bad. But whenever I come to this type of program, I really don't find the necessity why our teachers beat us up so mercilessly to uh, sh uh, teach us rights and wrongs. So, uh, I mean, we always talk about uh, national interest, national security, but we never talk about national morality. I mean, uh, I mean, do these types of words disappear from our uh, world uh, against the background of geopolitical realities? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please be brief because we are coming to the end now. So, Rush, you can ask your question, please be, be very brief. Uh, I have some question to our ex-foreign secretary. Uh, as uh, probably our Russian friends have left, uh, the uh, maximum equipments of our Bangladesh Air Force and many of our uh, Bangladesh Army, like our armored personnel carriers, like our ATGM, anti-tank guided missiles, and our uh, Yak-130 uh, ground attack aircraft, then uh, uh, MI-17 helicopters and uh, MiG-29, these all are from Russia. So we aligned with Russia and China basically uh, to get uh, our armaments. Now, if you consider the Myanmar scenario, China and Myanmar are both the suppliers of uh, Myanmar armed forces. Then due to these sanctions the, uh, imposed on Russia, what types of, uh, say, uh, difficulties we are going to face in near future. I just give one example of my journal, which I edit and run. I used to get advertisement from all over the world, from USA, from South Africa, from Turkish uh, companies, and from Russian companies, like Rosalind Export. Day before yesterday, Rosalind Export sent me a mail for, uh, to just to publish one advertisement of theirs. I used to publish uh, two or three uh, per year. And now I am in a deep problem. How to uh, how they will send the money, and whether I will, if I get if I publish the uh, advertisement and I take the money, whether uh, whether I will be under sanctions or not. So these are the uh, one part, and another part is that what uh, that professor has left. Me. Uh, I intended to like him some questions, that he was telling that. Ukraine, uh, Russia had the security concerns. I, uh, in one part, I agree. For Bangladesh, 
also India raised so many security concerns against us that our Muslim Bengalis had been going to India, these and that, which are absolutely wrong. But Bangladesh never attacked or did anything harm, uh, any harm to India. But if we are attacked, then what would we, uh, sh should we support it? According to his logic, then Ukraine didn't attack Russia. Russia attacked Ukraine. And another thing, no East European countries, those who were earlier with the Warsaw Pacts, never wanted to join the Russian Federation. Why they want to join European Union and NATO, including Finland, Sweden, and all other countries. Can you please specify? Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Chasha, please. Microphone here, please. Thank you, General. Um, my name is Sasha Blumen. I'm the Acting Deputy High Commissioner of the Australian High Commission. Uh, so I just thought I'd share Australia's position on the on the Russian invasion. So of course Australia uh, thoroughly condemns the in the strongest possible terms the illegal, unjust, and unprovoked unprovoked uh, invasion of Ukraine. It's a gross violation of international law, including the Uni Char Charter of the United Nations, and it's we strongly support Ukraine's sovereignty and its territorial integrity, and we call on Russia to immediately withdraw from Ukrainian territory consistent with the legally binding uh, decision of the International Court of Justice. Uh, this, uh, it's important that all states uh, comply with the uh, UN norms of, uh, of peaceful, re peaceful uh, resolution of, of, of uh, peaceful re resolution of uh, issues of territorial integrity and of uh, the sovereignty of states. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Shafkat Munir. I work for BIPS. I'm a bit intrigued by Professor Rulamin's comments. I think part of it has already been addressed by Mr. Rushd, so I won't uh, go into that. But especially his categorization that war on terror was a manufactured threat by the West. War on terror happened because of gross acts of terrorism, which were documented, proven, and all of us suffered. Let's not forget that Bangladeshis also died in 9-11. I get very uh, uh, puzzled when we see such comments uh, being bandied about in Bangladesh, that war on terror was manufactured, 9-11 didn't happen, and so on. And it's particularly disappointing when it comes from uh, scholars and professors of international relations. Also, uh, legitimate security interests. Every country has legitimate security interests. Can that justify aggression? Can that justify trampling another nation's sovereignty? I think uh, let's be very clear about these terms because uh, uh, this is uh, not a talk show or this is not a um, like a drawing room adda session. We are in a serious academic discussion here. So when we use uh, terms like uh, security interests so loosely, and as Mr. Roost has very rightly pointed out, we have to be very careful here. Because are we, in that uh, case, actually adding legitimacy to aggression and violation of another nation's sovereignty? And I think we have to be very clear. And please, let's not uh, get into debates about war on terror is manufactured, Afghans were freedom fighters, and so on. Those who carried out attacks on 9-11 in which many Bangladeshis also died were not freedom fighters. Adages like one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter, anachronistic relics of a bygone era. This is 2022. Uh, my request, let's wake up and face the new real realities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I have narrowed down uh, my question to our national perspective. Um, recently, we have seen the coronavirus pandemic has exposed the dismal order of the world order. And the nation has, uh, we, can, we have seen that nation has uh, regressed into narrow selfish policies. Their primary focus has been to uh, acquire hegemony instead of uh, resolving 
international or global challenges. So in this context, our national motto or our national slogan that <clears throat> the friendship to all and malice to none, how can it be tenable or maintainable? How far as, as, a, as a state like us can uh, you know, maintain this kind of, uh, what should I say, uh, policy uh, in the f unfolding events after the pandemic? Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we now, okay, this will be the very last because we are overshooting our time. Please be very brief. Okay, and introduce yourself. Because yeah, good afternoon. I'm Tanvir. I'm working as a fa faculty member in the Department of International Relations at University of Dhaka. Um, we often try to make up points as if, um, like, uh, international order is something that is uh, transforming. But one thing that is persistent in international order, um, I, and I do agree with Ashraf Sad that it has changed from being a conglomerate of Christian countries to empires and now to modern nation states. However, one key condition of international order remains the same, that is power principles. The countries that are more powerful tend to have a more higher position in the pecking order. And we always speak in Bangladesh always in terms of um, external balancing in terms of where we want to go. But balancing does have an internal aspect as well. Unless and until we are willing, unless and until our institutions are strong, I don't necessarily think Bangladesh can tackle the problems that are coming in. We are always talking in terms of um, external balancing, in terms of which uh, alliances or places we are going to go. But history pro proves us that as great power rivalry kind of um, gets more tougher, it, is, it will become increasingly difficult for Bangladesh to even make a normal transaction with various countries. That is something we are not necessarily considering. Is our foreign ministry and our institutions able to sustain the kind of consistent engagement that is required for us to face the challenges of the coming days? What is the concept of our economies? Where we depend on, on critical technologies? Do we have an internal um, capability to develop our research, our technological aspects? Or are we going to just jump from one alliance to another and try to do a juggling act and try to engage into these affairs? In order for us to be able to properly address these challenges, Bangladesh first necessarily needs to look inwards as well. Because we need to diversify in terms of economics. We mostly speak in terms of how Africa and uh, Latin America is a new ground for Bangladeshi foreign policy and Bangladeshi economic diplomacy to cover. But we aren't covered or we aren't engaged anywhere in that sense to begin with. Neither are we properly engaged with Europe nor are we properly engaged with the Southeast Asian neighbors, neither are we engaged with any of our neighbors. So we need to look into the very basic ideas of what we do. So in IR 101, what we teach and what we have learned is that never put all your eggs in the same basket. And what we are doing consistently is going to one basket and putting all the eggs there, and when you get kicked out from there, then we are going to put all our eggs in the another basket. That is not how a foreign policy of a country is supposed to be. We need to come up with consistent examples, and we need to come up with a consistent ways of behavior. So our voting patterns in UN perhaps has a consistency in terms of the historical patterns that Bangladesh has followed so far. However, in, as the days come and as great power rivalry intensifies, where we are going to stay. Because as of now, with regards to Ukraine crisis and with regards to some of the emerging issues in international affairs, we see a general confusion in Bangladeshi people. So it, we, our position in terms of uh, people to people will vary. But as time goes on and as we um, see developments coming up, Bangladesh will have to choose which position we choose, or even if we want to engage in some kind of a pragmatic diplomatic efforts, we need to engage our powers as well. Let us not kid ourselves. In 2008, it was not diplomacy that stopped Burmese ships from entering into Bangladesh space. It was our deterrent posture. So unless and until we are able to increase our powers as well, uh, I don't necessarily believe we would be able to take, but rather, uh, I don't believe we would be able to be, or we would be able to engage international affairs as a active role player, but rather as a silent observer or maybe someone who just is passive in terms of how international structure is going to be. If we want to be active, we have to change ourselves. That's, that's what I want Thank to you, Tanvir. Uh, I kind of agree with 
quite a bit of what you said, so we'll come back to that later. So we will now go back to our panelists. Please take about three to five minutes. So respond in general. Thank you so much. We'll first go to you, Tawhid. Okay, there are two questions specifically um, addressed to me, so let me uh, reply to those and then maybe one or two more, I'll just go generally. Morality. Uh, sorry, uh, it's a different, uh, totally different thing. Um, when, you te when a teacher, uh, te say, you and your friend, if you are selfish among your friends, you will be ostracized. But when it's a question of international relations, if you are looking after only your country's interest, you won't be ostracized. That's your job to do. Okay, so morality, the veneer of morality, often comes into play in international relations, but in reality, it is, going back to the realists, it is actually your interest that becomes supreme. Um, I will uh, relate this to uh, uh, the Australian DHC's comment also. Uh, of course, what Russia has done is condemnable. There is no doubt about that. They have uh, violated the international law and the uh, sovereignty of a, of a country. But again, uh, mind you, again, you are doing this because it goes with your interests also. Um, uh, similar things happened in the Middle East. Australia did not condemn, nor did many other countries. Ultimately, it's the interest that matters. Next question is uh, about the equipment. I know that uh, we are uh, it's not only uh, Russia, you know it very well that we are, uh, uh, our dependence on China is uh, basically unhealthy almost because um, we have seen that uh, we have, uh, now think of a situation in which you have a, uh, I hope it will not happen, you have a conflict with Myanmar. What happens to you? Both your suppliers are staunch supporters of Myanmar. We must, I have already mentioned this during my speech also, and there are other points which, because of positive time, I could not. We must diversify our sources of hard hardware. Uh, and we must go into some research and manufacturing also. I believe that we have that capability, particularly with the high-tech things. There, is pro there was proposal from uh, Turkey to enter into uh, many of their projects, including the drones. Uh, what decided the uh, outcome of the war between Armenia and Azerbaijan it was Turkish drones. These things should be actually carefully taken into consideration and we should uh, uh, go into those things. Well, uh, you, you do some uh, cannibalization and then things like that, or you procure some uh, goods in a clandestine way. These things happen all over the world, so uh, this is not... Uh, very unusual, and um, have I? Another one minute. Uh, one minute, okay. Uh, uh, he had initially spoken about one thing, market independence from aid dependence, yes. Uh, you see, when we buy something, we become dependent. When we sell something, we also become dependent. Now, uh, this, we have to get out of these things. My, uh, we should not actually be uh, st only stitching shirts. I uh, said in one occasion that, well, you cannot go to the high table just stitching shirts. You have to do other things. If you diversify, you become, others become dependent on you, as the world has become dependent on China, or for many of the goods. Very mundane goods, but then they are such big suppliers that others have become uh, dependent uh, on them. Um, Neocolonialism, Actually, it is always there. The colonialism itself was also for, for resources. And the neocolonialism that we have now is also for resources. Only the, uh, it is no longer profitable to occupy a country and run that country. So colonialism has gone. Colonialism has not gone because of high morality. It has gone because it became unprofitable. I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, there are more of comments and less questions, but uh, but I found that there are a few ones. It's, it's good to have some discussions. I'll begin with what Shafkat has said, and I fully agree with you. I mean, um, well, let's let's try to understand things academically. I mean, when it comes to the discussions of global war on terrorism and the terrorism discourse, 
I find that in the terrorism studies literature, there are two schools of thought. One is the orthodox and the traditional IR and security studies scholars, 95% of them. Uh, they argue that uh, terrorism is primarily a non-state activity directed against the state. So a state has the valid reasons to come very heavily against the terrorists. So uh, what 9-11 happened is a fact, not, not a conspiracy theory. Violent extremists deserve more attention from international actors and et cetera. But there are 5% academics like um, Noam Chomsky. Think about Noam Chomsky, American MIT faculty member. There are Marxist-oriented uh, critical theorists who believe that uh, states often reproduce um, violence and terror and manufacture to legitimize their military industrial complex. So maybe I see this debate uh, when he said that I, f I don't agree with Professor Ulamin, but I, I see this, him coming from a romanticist position, a Marxist critical theory maybe, and referring to uh, ontology. I think he was um, referring to something else. So I think it's good to have an informed debate on that. Uh, but, uh, but, uh, but, but I think that the, the large majority of people in the international system do agree that global war on terrorism is a war against uh, transnational actors and, and non-state actors and terrorists. Um, Tanvir made something interesting that uh, there is a need for soul searching and we need to have an inward looking assessment like to what extent are we capable of dealing with uh, dealing with the foreign policy challenges and he was referring to foreign po foreign ministry and other institutions making decisions and to what extent we are strengthening them. Uh, well, uh, definitely, I, I what I understand is that there are different desks in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, each has a very well researched team of young and, and, and DGs, directors, they do work very hard. They do assess things very, very, very passionately and then um, what is missing here is that uh, we, we have a, you know, we don't know to what extent our decisions we don't have are. A connection with the IR department. Right. I mean, what? Maybe. Right. Okay. Excellent. What I was saying is that uh, globally, and in fact, in the global north, there is a good practice of informed decision makings. Decisions are made on the basis of a lot of information, research, and inputs from civil societies and think tanks and academics. We we lack that culture. So, so it is not only the MOFA that needs reform; it is us that also needs reform. And part of this uh, us not having the capacity and the delivery of the research is that we lack the access to the data. So the government also needs to have a paradigm shift in terms of opening the archives and giving access to the academics in terms of so that they can have research and and inform the policy making. Um, well. Uh, Sean, I think his comment was was well addressed uh, vaccine, in terms of vaccine diplomacy and new colonialism. Ambassador Tovi has rightly said that uh, new colonialism is uh, is partly about economic benefits. Um, Air Force Marshal Mahmoud did not. It was not a question. I think it was more of a remark that uh, coming from three different right. Coming from three different theories, we can get three different policy imperatives. Um, we need a strong military deterrence that should come from a realist perspective. And also, uh, he is true that uh, when I talked about the uh, global governance and the liberal schools international order definition, I missed the regional part. So definitely, it is also a very strong foreign policy priority for Bangladesh to go regional, uh, you know, and then, uh, you know, strengthen, developing and strengthening institutions. So we tried with CERC, it failed. We are now trying with BIMSTEC. Uh, we are trying with BCIM and BBIN, but here also great power and external power influence comes in because uh, we see the differing agenda. Uh, BCIM is seen more to be a China-driven regionalism, and uh, BIMSTEC is seen more as an India-driven regional, you know, initiative. So uh, we need to we need to find a, a, you know, a good position for us, like you know, to 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 revitalize these institutions and making our 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 interest uh, well achieved. Um, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much for your last comments. Uh, it has been a very rich discussion, I must say, and we all agree and we go back from here much enriched than we came here in, in, the, in the afternoon. And it is a given fact that the international system is in a flux. The fluidity in the inter international system gives a lot of challenges to countries like Bangladesh and small states. It does also offer opportunities because we can reassess, reposition, and also gain strength. One thing that the Secretary very rightly mentioned that all states have interests, their permanent interests, no permanent friends. And 
Like any other country, we should also not have a permanent friend. We should only, only have permanent interest. And that's the way to go. And having realist tendencies, I fully agree with Anvid that one of the key capabilities that Bangladesh needs to address is our capacity for deterrence. There is no alternative to deterrence. And in terms of opportunities, I see that many of the countries are now realigning themselves, repositioning themselves in the international system. So we also must reassess our positions. We have tremendous opportunities of shaping policies in the global commons like the cyberspace, where even the smaller states can put their input and shape a policy that has, comes to the benefit of small states. Our challenges are also going to come from the maritime space that we are involved in, because we are a maritime nation. We never must, we should never forget that Bangladesh is a key maritime nation in the Indian Ocean. We are one of the gatekeepers to the Bay of Bengal. We provide key access to the Bay of Bengal. We can either provide access or we can deny access. So we have tremendous capacity as a maritime nation. That should be not taken as a challenge, but translated into our benefit. Well, there's are many, many food for thought, but I would like to thank you again for being with us this afternoon to talk on an issue which is very, very pertinent for not only Bangladesh, but everybody in the region and beyond. Please come to our events in future. We always exchange very meaningful exchanges with you, which are of tremendous benefits as we research on these issues. So please join me in thanking our panelists and join us for a cup of tea outside. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you everyone for being being here with us today.